Thank you for joining us today. Today, we're going to talk about school readiness skills and how to build those basic foundational skills for school, starting from birth. Um, really talking about what your child needs to be a successful learner in school and be ready for their first day of kindergarten. My name is Lauren George. I am the Family Support Specialist with Child Care Answers. So in my role, I help families locate child care. I provide one-on-one -on -one consultations and support for families around parenting and their child's development. And then I also present and create parenting workshops. My specialty is really in supporting families who have infants and toddlers and children with special needs. I am also a mom of two kiddos. I have a seven-year-old boy and a three-year-old daughter. Uh, my son is in second grade and then my daughter is in childcare. And then I have experience and background as a two-year-old teacher. If you don't already do so, follow Child Care Answers on social media. We have an active Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account, as well as we post all of our webinars onto YouTube. You can also visit childcareanswers.com slash your child for lots of parenting tips and resources. Child Care Answers is part of a larger network of child care resource and referral agencies. We service Marion, Hamilton, and Hendricks counties in Indiana, but there is a resource and referral agency in your area if you are not located in ours. Um, don't hesitate to contact me. I can answer your questions and get you connected to the right person for you. Two resources that I want to point out on that parenting page on our website is the new normal which is the guidebook to going back to school and what school looks like during the time of COVID. Um, there are resources and links in there as well as great tools for parenting like picture books on wearing masks, explaining COVID to your child, um, questions you might ask or things you might look for in childcare or school um, in the world of COVID, et cetera. And then we also have our kindergarten transition guide. And this is a guidebook for you as you're preparing for that transition from childcare or preschool age child to kindergarten. Um, it talks about kind of the time frame in which to be looking for school, making that decision, starting that enrollment process, as well as how to choose the best school for your family. And then what that transition might look like in the summer leading up to kindergarten. So as we begin talking about school readiness and kindergarten transition and preparing our children to go off to school, it's important to really kind of think about and reflect on what we think as parents those skills are that every child needs in order to be ready for kindergarten. Some of these might be skills that others have told you that you looked up on the internet things that you might have heard from from kindergarten teachers or just our own ideas about what it means to be ready for kindergarten. Oftentimes we think as parents, these are things like knowing how to write their name, knowing their address, knowing their colors, their shapes, their letters, and maybe even some pre-reading skills. But is that what they really need to know to go off to kindergarten? Is that all they need to know? Um, what is it? What are those foundational skills that we really need to be embedding starting at birth in our children? So Head Start views school readiness really as a child's ability to possess the skills, knowledge, and attitudes necessary for school success and for later life learning. Readiness doesn't just mean knowing the academic basics, but it really means that a child has a willing attitude and confidence in the process of learning. That they're excited about learning, they have the ability to sit still and learn new information, um, and they really have that social emotional foundation for later school success. This is a foundation that begins really at birth. So by the time a child turns three, they've already laid a pretty solid foundation for lifelong learning and success. So when we're talking to our baby, we're gooing back and forth, um, we're changing their diaper and talking to them about that process. 
those are all essential pieces that are preparing your child for later success. Um, so those foundational skills are set early on um, and we continue to support their learning in that first five years of life. Additionally, when a child is born, they have about 25% of their adult brain fully formed. And by year one, um, so in that first year of life, they've developed about 75% of their adult brain. A lot of connections are forming that are laying that foundation for things like language, physical development, social emotional development, and those academic skills. So what are those foundational skills for school readiness? So again, readiness is not about the academic skills, but rather looking at a child's development overall, really looking at that child on a whole. So how do families help their child gain those skills and show emotional readiness in order to, th to thrive in those school-based settings? And number one, it's by being responsive to all areas of your child's development, their emotional well-being, their social development, um, their emotional and social development within the context of their culture, their thinking skills and their cognitive development, their whole body development physically, and then their language skills. So children are born with this great ability to learn and grow. And as caregivers and parents, we can let, we can really set that foundation by the experiences that we provide from them early on. So as we look about, you know, supporting these experiences in our young children and getting them ready for success in school and life, it's really about laying the foundation through experiences. So if you take this picture, for example, this baby is playing with a tower of blocks. Someone likely built that tower for this baby, and then he is pushing his hand forward in order to knock the block tower over. Likely someone built this tower and knocked it over for him and then made this huge exaggeration to basically say like, oh no, our block tower fell over, gauging his interest in pulling him in. They built that tower back up and either knocked it over again or allowed him that opportunity to knock it over, repeating that same phrase. Oh no, it fell over, let's do it again. And they did it over and over and over again, laying that foundation for things like building, critical thinking skills, gravity, all of these things that are really showing him early on um, through repetition that every time this tower is built and I knock it over, those blocks always fall down to the ground. As his parent or caregiver is engaging in this experience, He's gonna to continue to develop the skills that he eventually is building up that tower by himself and knocking it over all by himself. And then at one point, he's gonna come over and knock somebody else's tower down because he knows he can and it's fun. And that's just fine. He's really developing that ability to problem solve and to think about kind of the process of play in his mind. So as we're developing all of these skills, um, the, one of the first skills that we can help our children to develop is their independent thought and independent processing. So from birth, children are on this quest for independence. Um, we, try, we see this as babies try to spoon feed themselves or insist on taking their diaper off by themselves. You know, toddlers are demanding to dress themselves, to turn the faucet on at the sink. Um, you hear that toddler go, I do it or me do it. They're really wanting to be independent and do things by themselves. So as the caregiver or adult, it's important to provide opportunities that help children to develop independence and build this sense of self and self-esteem. Um, it also, as they're kind of trying to do things by themselves, they're making choices, they're problem solving. Um, they're also learning how to deal with frustration and perseverance. So as we're supporting our child's independence, it's important to allow them to make choice. Um, so toddlers and preschoolers have little control over their environment. Um, so the more opportunities that we can give them to make choices or feel empowered, um, builds that self-confidence that I can do things by myself and I don't need someone to do it for me. 
So things like this um, is maybe we're offering them the choice when we're trying to cross the street and they want to run out into the middle of the street um, to either hold a hand or get carried. Um, as they are going to bed of maybe allowing them the choice over their pajamas. Um, at mealtime, letting them choose if they want to eat with a fork or a spoon or their red cup or the yellow cup. Um, there are a lot of ways that we can empower children to make choices while also picking our own battles because a lot of times it's just really not that deep. We also want to let our child help fostering their confidence and communicating trust. Giving them that opportunity to do something by themselves is going to also help calm down on tantrums and redirect their behavior because they feel like they have some sense of control and that they're part of the larger community. It fosters their sense of confidence and helps them feel like they can do things on their own. So these are things like giving them the opportunity to carry the dishes from the table to the sink. Um, these are things like giving them the power to fill up water bottles before it's time to go to the park um, or helping a sibling. Um, and when they start to do these things within tasks, within routines, it becomes embedded and kind of part of the day. And then you also want to allow your child to solve problems. So don't rush in and solve it for them. This is true for play. It's true for those academic skills, and it's also true for social emotional development. So if you see your child struggling, you can offer support. Um, you can acknowledge that they are struggling, but you don't want to go in and necessarily solve the problem for them. As we allow them to work on solving their own problems, they're learning critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, and they're learning to persevere when things get challenging. You can also provide tasks that offer just a little bit of extra challenge. Um, so if you know your child can do something on their own, make it a little bit more complicated um, so that they have to kind of figure out how to solve that problem. Giving them that opportunity to do that. What this looks like in social relationships is that when you, your child is struggling, maybe with a sibling or another friend, of not solving their emotional problems for them, but rather giving them the tools and the words to use in that problem. My son and my daughter have a lot of situations like this where they might be fighting over toys or how they're going to play a certain way. So my daughter at three might come in and just snatch a toy from her brother. He gets mad and he hits her or he snatches it back. Um, or they come to me crying, asking me to basically fix their problems. So instead of swooping in and solving it, I give them the words to use in that moment. I might tell him, tell her, I don't like it when you take that. I'm playing with that. You can have it when I'm done. I can tell the three-year-old to ask instead of taking. You can't take that. He's playing with that. Instead, you need to say, when you're done, can I have a turn, please? And then my job as the adult in that situation is then to help her wait uh, for her turn to come. Um, so it's giving them that opportunity to solve their own problems within peer relationships and not us kind of swooping in and solving it for them. Also, we wanna focus on those self-help skills. Um, so your child should know how to wipe their face after lunch without being prompted, to be able to blow their nose without assistance, to know how to wash their hands after blowing their nose, but they also need to be comfortable enough to ask for help when necessary. So as we're preparing our child to go off to school, we wanna encourage them to dress themselves. Um, this may mean putting their pajamas on before bed or putting their own coat on before they go out. Um, knowing how to take off their shoes and hang up their coat when they come in from outside um, and providing that foundation for them to be able to use the bathroom without assistance. Um, so giving them reminders, um, putting up visuals, talking them through the process, but allowing them time to do it by themselves so that they are learning how to do these things without prompts and without reminders as they get older and more confident. Our child also needs to have opportunities to serve themselves um, and to eat independently, um, to be able to do all of those things by themselves, because in a classroom of 30 children in kindergarten, 
a teacher just can't do it all for everyone. Um, but at the end of the day, if a child needs help, they should have that ability and capacity to know how to ask for help if necessary. As we're also preparing them for kindergarten and school, but also for later success, it's important to read. So read aloud to your child, give them opportunities to practice and play with books, give them opportunities to read to you. Um, and I say in quote to read because more than likely the child isn't reading the actual words, but telling a story based on the pictures or reiterating the stories that they have heard you say over and over again. Teach them that the words on the page have a meaning, that there is an order in which you read, um, and how to kind of manipulate and hold books. Also, point things out in your environment, read signs to them, talk about what those signs mean, but make reading and literacy part of your everyday life. Additionally, it's important that we're teaching our children responsibility. So it really starts with starting to transfer small responsibilities over to our child um, if we haven't done so already. Um, and so I've mentioned a few of these as we're building their independence, but you know, it could be a job of picking up sticks before we have a bonfire or filling up water bottles before we go to the park or emptying the pool bag when we come home from the pool of giving them small jobs and allowing them to take responsibility. Also let your child accept responsibility for age appropriate tasks instead of doing it, them, doing it for them. So as you're buckling your child into the car seat, let them do the own, their own top snap themselves. Let them put their own shoes on. Let them try um, to start to do things by themselves. And then when our child does take the initiative, praise and acknowledge that. Point out that you noticed um, and that you're really proud of them for doing something on their own. Um, one example of this is not that long ago, my seven-year-old just kind of stood up and came to the kitchen and made him and his sister lunch. Um, and it was that perfect opportunity to acknowledge and praise that he took the initiative. Was there a mess? Absolutely, um, but it didn't matter because he took the initiative to not only make himself something to eat, but his sister as well, of transferring that responsibility over to him and praising and acknowledging that you did that. And that was really awesome. And look what you can do. Also, it's really important that we're developing and following routines because routines really matter. Um, so we want to set up morning routines that really transfer into the school setting by getting up early at the same time every day, getting dressed, having a healthy breakfast, brushing our teeth, things that are a great way of transitioning us from waking and then on to our day. These routines should be predictable so that children know what to expect and they should be very consistent. Um, other examples of routines are maybe your bedtime routine or your dinner routine or what your day looks like when you come home from school or home from childcare. Again, so that there's consistency throughout their day. Children and adults um, do much better when they can anticipate their day and they're equipped with the tools to be successful. And setting up a routine um, really allows children to understand the sequences of their day and anticipate what comes next. Additionally, one of the big pieces that people think is kindergarten readiness is knowing their colors, their shapes, their letters, how to write their name, and then even some of those pre-reading skills. But really, it's getting them interested in learning and having kind of this literacy or phonemic awareness. So I am aware of numbers, I'm aware of shapes, I'm aware of colors, and embedded through play, I probably know some of those things, but it's not necessarily pre-reading. Um, it's developing that ability to want to read or want to write once they go off to school. And it's having that hand strength and the ability to hold a pencil um, once I go off to school. So you don't give a five-year-old a pencil and say, okay, go write your name without ever having experience with shapes, with letters, with writing utensils, 
or building that hand strength before they go off to kindergarten. So some great ways of encouraging literacy development that isn't giving them a flashcard, because we all know that that is not really how our brains work, are doing things like the rainbow writing tray, which is colored paper on a tray, throw some salt on top of it, and children can make shapes, designs, and then eventually translating that knowledge to letters and numbers in the salt. It's a great sensory experience. Um, it's also a full body movement as they're making those letters, which is different than like the little movements that they're making when they're holding a pencil. Additionally, below that is a picture of Play-Doh. Play-Doh is really great for developing that ability to use their muscles in their hands to write. Play-Doh is also a great multi-sensory tool that can be used in addition to developing hand strength to be able to manipulate Play-Doh into letters and shapes and numbers and different animals and figurines. Um, the next picture is Letter Hunt. Um, this again is another multi-sensory way of learning literacy. Um, in this picture, this child is looking for letters in a sensory table. Again, a multi-sensory experience where they're learning with their hands and it can be done in a variety of different ways. So in this, that child is looking for letters and then matching them up with letters on the paper. They don't even necessarily need to know what that letter is. Um, it's really just letter awareness that I know that what I'm holding in my hand is a shape or a letter, um, which will then allow me later on as I get older to then be able to identify what that actual letter is. Additionally, as that child is picking up the letter and matching it to the paper, they're actually doing math um, as they're learning matching skills. So there you have kind of a literacy and a math activity all embedded within this hands-on sensory opportunity. And then lastly, we have the dirt Play-Doh. And this is a sensory writing tray where this child is actually taking stones on brown Play-Doh and making either letters or shapes um, out of those stones. So what this activity could look like as a child is getting older is a toddler using this to just make shapes with larger stones that are not a choking hazard. As they get a little bit older, you might start to utilize those smaller pebbles like in this picture to start developing that pincher grass for those small muscle movements, starting to maybe translate that knowledge from making a circle to making an uppercase letter. And then as that child develops awareness of uppercase letters, which is usually not even until kindergarten, then they start to translate that to lowercase letters as they get a little bit older. So that is kind of a way that you might adapt that based on the age of your child. As we look at school readiness as more than those academic skills, their emotional development is key. So it's really important that we're acknowledging our child's feelings, we're talking to them about the transition of kindergarten, um, we are labeling their feelings, we're allowing them opportunities to regulate their emotions, and this really all starts at birth. Um, so it's first acknowledging our child's feelings, and acknowledging doesn't mean that we're giving in to the feelings, but we're letting them know that those feelings are okay to have. It's okay to feel sad, it's okay to feel mad, it's okay to feel angry, it's okay to feel frustrated. The behaviors that you might exhibit because of those feelings, those might be inappropriate. However, the actual feeling itself is fine to have. So it's acknowledging the feeling by saying things like, I hear how sad you feel that you can't wear your dinosaur costume to preschool. Or I know you don't want to put your pajamas on. It's hard to go from playtime to bedtime. Or it's hard to wait. Um, my three-year-old always says, mom, it's hard to wait. They say, you're right, it is so hard to wait. What are some things that we can do while we wait? Um, so it's acknowledging those feelings. It's reassuring them that you're still there and that those difficult feelings are normal. Some of that is modeling and saying, you know, mommy's very mad or dad's very angry. Um, and this is why I'm mad. And this is how I'm gonna deal with being mad. So that they know that you're feeling those same feelings as well. And then it's reassuring them that they are loved and they are safe. 
even if they have this giant full-blown tantrum, it's letting them know that they are still loved, they are safe, and you're still there for them. That doesn't mean that I had a tantrum because I wanted a cookie and now you give me the cookie. I'm still going to say, you're not getting a cookie, but I feel why you're angry about not getting a cookie. Like that stinks. I, I would like a cookie right now too, but we're gonna have dinner in 30 minutes. It's just not time for a cookie, but letting them know that they are safe and loved. Sometimes just simply saying, do you need a hug? Is that magic phrase to get them to move out of those feelings and emotions, let them know it's okay to be sad and I'm here for you. I'm gonna get my hug and then we're gonna move on. Other kids need to live in those feelings. So they need a safe space for them to just get it out. And they need a reassuring adult to say, get your feelings out. It's okay to feel, feel all of them. And then when you're done, I'm here for you. And then last but not least, as we're getting our children ready for school, it's really being able to nurture their free play skills. So as our children are engaging with materials in this unstructured, independent way of playing, um, we're really fostering their creativity, their problem solving, and their independence. Um, so this is kind of that foundation in the first five years that we want our children just playing, not sitting down and doing a worksheet or flashcards or this or that, but really just playing, being able to use materials in the way that their mind is wanting to use them. As simple as a baby engaging with stacking cups, something to an adult that might look boring, we might want to choose a toy that has lots of bells and whistles and does lots of things. But this is the toy that is really beneficial for this child stage of development something that can be used in a variety of ways. I can bang them together, I can stack, I can nest them. They're different colors. You can talk to me about the colors while I'm playing. I can put it in my mouth and I can taste it. I can put stuff in, I can dump things out. Um, the possibilities are really endless. And when we allow our child to just play, that's serious business. Um, and that's really laying that foundation for life. So we want to offer our child a lot of materials like writing materials, crayons, markers, chalk, finger paint. As they get older, pens, pencils, staplers, tapes, scissors, building materials like blocks, magnetiles, Legos, um, Lincoln logs, and imaginary play props like dress up clothes, play kitchen, real items like old cell phones and keyboards, things that you're really allowing your child to do kind of whatever with. There's no right or wrong way to play with those materials. So while your child is playing, we're really setting that opportunity and foundation for them to foster their sense of wonder and their sense of play. So you can say things to them like, I'm proud of you for sticking with that puzzle or when they are struggling to acknowledge that I saw you struggling putting that together, but you kept going and I'm really proud of you for that. Your child might say, I made a tower. And sometimes we're busy and our response might be, uh-huh, or good job. But to really acknowledge that they are proud of their work by just repeating back to them, you made a tower letting them know that you are just as excited about their work as they are. Commenting on the things they're doing, like I see you drew a rainbow, or I see you worked really hard on that, or great job lining up those blocks. And then as you're engaging together with them, of recognizing that and drawing attention to that by saying things like, we're building a tower together, letting them know that you're glad that you are engaging and play alongside of them. But at the end of the day, it's their play. We are a playmate with them, but it is their, their play and we are following their lead as they're exploring um, those materials. So here are some kind of ideas or what open-ended play might look like. So what I love about open-ended play is there's no right or wrong way to do it. And it looks like so many different things. So it can look like pretending to be pirates, 
It can look like playing Play-Doh or engaging in a cooking activity. It can look like making animal shadows in a dark room. It can look like building a sandcastle or filling up buckets of sand outside. It can look like going up and down the slide. And yes, it's okay for your child to go up the slide. And not only is it okay, it is a completely different set of skills that are important for your child to develop. And it also might look like engaging in loose parts or small part play, like beads and clay and rocks and different materials that aren't choking hazards for children under three. So as you're looking at choosing the right toys to promote open-ended play in your child's development, you want to look at toys that really support your child's area of development and where they are now, as well as where they're going to be next. So thinking about a baby who's starting to crawl, maybe pull up or cruise around items, it's thinking ahead to give them opportunities to practice cruising and then walking by giving them larger toys that they can pull up on, um, a push toy, a push toy that might translate to a writing toy as they get a little bit older, but really thinking developmentally of where your child is at and where they want to be next. Also looking at toys that really spark your child's imagination, creativity and problem solving skills like puzzles and blocks and shape sorters and stacking cups and pretend play materials. Additionally, using kind of everyday items um, that also spark creativity and, and imagination, like pots and pans, um, old keyboards, phones, um, all sorts of non-play materials like cardboard boxes and toilet paper holders and all sorts of stuff. Also choosing toys based on your child's interests or things that they love and choosing things that are kind of open-ended um, and when I say no batteries, I don't necessarily mean that no toy your child can have can have batteries, but you really want to avoid toys that you press one button and it does something and that's kind of all the toy does. Um, so not a lot of bells and whistles. So as we're looking at toys that might be based on a child's interest, um, it's being able to take what they are interested in and then expand their learning beyond to that. So my son, when he was two, was obsessed with lawn tools and lawn equipment. Um, so we bought him a lot of tools like um, hammers and drills and all kinds of stuff like that. His own rake, a lawn mower, a leaf blower, a weed eater, all of these things so that he could do his own work alongside of us. And from that experience, he learned colors, he learned brands. He learned how to use different tools, things that I didn't even know about. The possibilities were really endless. Um, he transferred then to a three and four year old obsessed with the vacuum cleaners. So now I know how vacuums work in a way that I never thought I would know. Um, and construction vehicles were another huge interest. So being able to really take his interest and expand upon that opens up learning in a completely different way. And then don't be afraid to choose. You choose what you think is the most appropriate toy for your child. Even if they want something else um, or they're starting to kind of go into a different direction, you choose based on what you know about their development and problem solving and their interest to really choose the things that you find are best for your child, best suited for them. So after we've supported their emotional development, their social development, we've created this child who's independent, who can think on their own, who has abstract thought, who isn't afraid to say, hey, I need help. We have basically developed this child who's ready for kindergarten. So what does a school ready look, child look like? They're confident, curious, they're persistent, they're communicative, they can solve problems, they have some level of self-control over their body and they want to be there. It's a child who can sit in the carpet and say, I have a question and they're not afraid to raise their hand. They're the child who isn't afraid to advocate for themselves, to say, hey, I need to go to the bathroom. And they're a child who's wanting to persevere and persist through challenging situations, both academically and also with their peers. 
And they're a child who's confident, creative, and is empathetic of other people's feelings and emotions. So what's missing on this list? What is a kindergartner? What is, what is not kindergarten readiness? What is not a kindergarten ready child? And that's something that I really want you to reflect on. I didn't say anything about a child who could read. I didn't say anything about a child who could count to 20. I didn't say anything about a child who knows the street that they live on. These are all things that a child learns when they are ready to learn. And so as we're setting that foundation for kindergarten readiness, we're really laying that foundation for a child who is ready to learn and confident in their learning process. So below you'll see a link to our readiness checklist. Um, it is a great tool to kind of gauge is your child on track. That includes a lot of these things that we already talked about. But I'm going to tell you a secret. You don't need a kindergarten readiness checklist. You don't need any of that. And it's really not complicated. Talk to your child, read to your child, empathize, label their feelings, and just provide them opportunity to play and your child will be ready for kindergarten. So as you're looking for more information or resources on school readiness or child development in general, um, here are some great tools. So outside of the articles that I pulled information from, the Child Mind Institute is a fantastic resource when it comes to building your child's social emotional development and also has great tools for things like ADHD, children with challenging behaviors, autism, and the like. Also NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, is chock full of resources. Um, their focus is typically on childcare programs and then the families that attend childcare. And so they have information on kindergarten readiness, on play, um, on toileting, on developing peer relationships and so much more. And then as you're supporting your child's development for children under three, zero to three is your go-to resource. They have information on school readiness, toileting, biting, play, breastfeeding, language development. And what I thought was pretty cute is an article about responding to toddler sass, um, because we know that all toddlers have a little bit of sass. Um, and so those are the kind of resources that they have on their website. So last but not least, um, here is my contact information. Again, I am available as a resource to you for free to talk about your child's development, to help you locate the right school for your child, um, to provide you opportunities and experiences that you can provide at home to support your child's learning, or just to answer any of your parenting questions. So you can email me at laureng at childcareanswers.com. You can fill out our family info form, or you can always text me at 833-222-1221. So thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future.